Today on Locked On Kings, three diehard Kings fans and loyal Locked On Kings listeners join me for our first ever Sacramento Kings fan roundtable discussing a whole bunch of stuff here from your fellow fans on today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time, time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December, this is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I've been a Sacramento sports media member for the last seven years. This is my eighth season and covering the Kings for uh, ABC 10 News here in Sacramento. But I always share that I grew up a diehard fan of the Sacramento Kings. That's how I started. That's how I fell in love with basketball. Uh, And uh, I I proudly wear being a Kings fan at heart uh, on my sleeve, even if I do have to kind of stray away from that at times with the the professionalism that is sports journalism covering a team uh, and things like that. But one of the reasons why I love the Kings so much is this phenomenal fan base. One of the reasons I love what I do so much. In fact, I think the main reason I love what I do so much is because of the fan base and the interaction uh, that I get from it. So the fact that I can do one of these uh, Kings fan roundtables and invite three amazing Kings fans on Alan, uh, Devin and Marina, very much looking forward to, uh, to chatting with the three of them. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. You're going to hear different fan perspectives on things that are happening with the Sacramento Kings right now. We're talking about, uh, the Halliburton Sabonis uh, trade. We're talking about expectations for the remainder of this season, this upcoming off season's players. We'd like to see traded or, or, or uh, stick around uh, expectations for the following season. Like, is this team going to be an eighth seed? Does, do they have to be better than that? Is it okay if they are just a play in team or the ton of stuff that we're going to discuss? Also uh, some thoughts on Arco arena, uh, which on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, we say uh, farewell to before it gets, uh, gets demolished here in Sacramento. So a lot of great conversation. I really, really think you're, going to enjoy this. I really enjoyed this. I cannot wait uh, to do more of these. When I first just threw out this idea on social media on a whim, I had so many people reach out and say they wanted to be a part of it. I already have a list going of of people for future fans only podcasts or rather fans roundtable podcasts that I'm going to be doing uh, probably this off season and beyond. Uh, So if you're on that list or if I've chatted with you, don't, uh, don't worry, we will get to you at some point in time. Uh, if you are interested in being a part of it, you can reach out to me at any time on Twitter at Matt George Sack or email me Matt George Sports at gmail.com. But my conversation with these three amazing Kings fans is going to dominate uh, the podcast today. I hope you enjoy it. Kings basketball back tomorrow uh, as they host the Chicago Bulls. Uh, we'll chat about that briefly at the end of this show. But here it is, my conversation, the first ever Locked on Kings fan roundtable. We've done Locked on Kings media roundtables, which you've really seemed to enjoy. We've done fans-only podcasts with one-on-one conversations between myself and some amazing Sacramento Kings fans. So I thought, why not combine the two? Why not welcome in multiple Sacramento Kings fans, listeners of the Locked on Kings podcast, to join me to just discuss the current state of the Sacramento Kings. Kings basketball right now, maybe not the most interesting around this time of the year, unfortunately, although technically the Kings still are in the mix. Uh, so I'm very excited to do one of what I hope will be many of these uh, these Kings fan roundtables that I'll do uh, over the course of the existence of the Locked On Kings podcast. And on the first ever uh, Kings fan roundtable here on Locked On Kings, I have three amazing fans that I'm so excited uh, to be able to talk Kings basketball with. I'm going to introduce uh, each one of you guys one at a time, have you guys kind of introduce yourselves a little bit. And we'll start actually with you, Devin. It's Devin Heston. And, and Devin, we discussed or actually had you recently on a locked on Kings podcast. You sent in an audio track of some of your thoughts on a topic that we're going to discuss here in just a little bit, Uh, but welcome in my man. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Hey, thanks, Matt. Really appreciate you doing this and having us on. Um, Yeah, basically I've been a Kings fan for about, I think two or three years now. I'm not from Sacramento originally. I moved up here. My my wife is a a lifelong Kings fan. Um, and I kind of 
always wanted to have like the um, the ability to kind of talk with other fans in the area. So I kind of figured uh, moving up here was a perfect time to adopt the Kings as my team. Um, really like doing draft stuff. So really excited to, to talk some Kings basketball. Coming up next, we have uh, Marina Drab and Marina. Uh, I, I've been uh, we've only interacted for a short a short time on social media, and I've been interested to see some of the stuff, at least in your bio, some of the stuff that you do. If you want to uh, share a little bit about what you do following the Kings, yeah, definitely. Hi, everybody. Uh, Marina Drab. I am covering the Kings for Sacktown Royalty in my first season, so I'm writing for uh, the SB Nation uh, Kings beat. And uh, aside from that, uh, been a Kings fan my whole life. Kings haven't made the playoffs since I was nine. So um, it's been a while, but um, kind of always in that glory days of Sacramento Kings and Monarchs, um, trying to keep those memories alive. So um, yeah, uh, full-time writer, full-time fan, and just happy to be here. Thank you. Checking both boxes, media and fans, love that. Yeah. And I, 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 can, I can relate, Marina, because I was, I think, six years old. The no, I wasn't. I was a little bit older than that. How old was I? Ten years old. The last time the Kings made the playoffs, yeah, ten years old or around that. So uh, I, I feel that. And then finally, this guy, I actually want to do a little bit of introduction with because Alan Holder is someone that that I have interacted with really since I started my media career here in Sacramento. And also, uh, you might be familiar seeing Alan because he's been around Sacramento sports for a while, whether it's Rivercats games, Republic games. And I think, Alan, I don't know if you've done any Kings games recently, but you uh, you do the national uh, anthem uh, playing your guitar amongst other gigs that you do. Alan, uh, if you could introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, my name is Alan Holder, and uh, I went to my first game in 1995 and didn't really, I wasn't really into it that much, but probably about 97, 98, I actually became a fan. And then, uh, you know, obviously got to be part of the glory years, watching them bring out the merchandise for the Western Conference champions during the fourth quarter that was never used, and I'm not sure where it went. Um, but so I, you know, I will be honest, I kind of went through a few years of you know, not really following, but in the last five, six years, you know, I really tried to, uh, you know, keep up despite obviously, you know, the, the challenges. Um, but, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, I have not played for the Stockton Kings, uh, since 2020. Um, but, uh, the Sacramento Kings don't use, seem to like electricity. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah, I'll be out at the river cats next month and then, uh, the Republic sometime later this season. So, um, but anyway, you know, I just, I think that, uh, you know, following the team for this time, you know, I've been around, as I said, I started feeling old when I saw guys coaching that I watched play. And now I feel old because guys who I watched play now have children who are playing for our team, thankfully. So, uh, anyway, you know, that's, that's my story. That's pretty crazy. I mean, I remember the first time, not that, I mean, I, I, I remember the first time talking to Kings players that were my age or, or younger than me and how hard that hit. So Alan, I can't even, I can't even imagine uh, where, where you're at. And I'm very, very much looking forward to maybe similar opinions, the difference of opinions, the difference of generations, just everything in regards to the Sacramento Kings team. Cause one thing's for sure, unfortunately for the majority of the years, that the Kings have been here in Sacramento with the exception of that glorious run that we all hang our hat on and try and relive as much as we can. The Kings have been really bad, like pretty inept. The one thing that's been most consistent throughout this entire time, if not consistent, the completely is the, the support of the Sacramento Kings fan base who in large part is, is, is the reason why, the team actually stayed in Sacramento, the NBA and David Stern decided to keep the team uh, in Sacramento. And as much as those, those, that announcement that the Kings were staying was wonderful, unfortunately that, that grace period for Vivek and those, those happy memories and just the happiness of having basketball in Sacramento, that's worn off a bit. Now you have a team that is uh, looking at 16 straight seasons without making the playoffs. There are many that believe it's going to reach 20 before the Kings actually make the playoffs. The fact that all of us pat ourselves on the back that we're still around covering this team for that long of a drought is pretty significant. But even so, uh, Devin, it feels like we have this conversation 
every single year, which is what's better for the Sacramento Kings? Is it better for them to put themselves in a good position for draft lottery odds to potentially get that game changer in the playoffs? Or is it better for the Kings to win right now, even if their chances of the playoffs are unlikely? It's a bit different this year now that Fox and Sabonis are together. And Sabonis, with the exception of Weber, is arguably the best player that the Kings have traded for. You shared your thoughts on this, but here's an opportunity to go a little bit deeper where you stand on. What do you think is better for the Kings for the remainder of this season? Well, I think uh, what's better for them isn't what I want for them to do. Obviously, I, I always want them to win. But if you look at the their past history, I mean, they are only above two teams in the West, and those two teams are outright tanking. And they're trying to win right now, and it, nothing is coming of it. Their, their win-loss record is worse since the trade, since before the trade. I mean, which kind of is good for my my viewpoint because it means our, our draft pick is going to be higher most likely. Um, I never want the team to lose, but that is the only way that I can um, see them being able to build onto what they have with Sabonis and Fox and kind of get to the next step. I was going to say, Marina, where, so where are you at with that specifically? Are you kind of in the same, it's, it's to me, I, I kind of separated it as it's a heart argument as Devin kind of talked about. It's not what he wants to do, but it's a kind of the logical argument of what would be if it was a strategy game, the best case scenario for the Kings. Where are you at with that? Yeah, I feel like, unfortunately, it's like Groundhog Day where like we kind of have this conversation at this time every year. Like, should we mail it in and just like start? Um, you know, experimenting as uh, Alvin Gentry put it the other night with uh, lineups and rotations. And honestly, I think uh, similarly, as much as I would like us to, since we're in the position, like we might as well get a higher uh, lottery pick. I would actually really like to see Fox and Sabonis and whoever their cast around them will be going forward, get some reps and build some chemistry because we only have, you know, 14 ish games left on the calendar and it's a long off season from April to October. So I would really like to see them like build and try. I know that um, positionally that doesn't really make the most sense if we want a higher pick, but as Devin said, we're trying and we're still losing. So um, I don't think it could hurt for us to keep trying to win games um, while at the same time kind of letting go of that uh, elusive 10th seed dream that we all were hanging on to for the last month or so. I I think, uh, and I think the reality of it is that we're kind of too late in the game to really make a run at the play-in. So I use the analogy of it's kind of like if you're at your job, if you had six brand new employees that you did not have time to train, but you still need them to work. You want those people to have an opportunity to play together. You know, it's not like in seasons past where it's like, oh, play the young guys. Let's see what they can do. It's like, no, I want to see what this yeah. unit can do mm -hmm. together. So at least one, you have an idea of them building some chemistry. And two, have like, hey, what do we want to do in the future? And, uh, you know, what what does this look like? I mean, and I will tell you as a, as a fan, before the trade, there were games where I was like, oh, this just isn't fun to watch. And I'm mm -hmm. turning it off. Now, as I say, entertaining losses, and I'm okay with that. And at the same time, you know, uh, you know, re, you know, I think we all know a higher draft pick does not mean we'll be successful. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say I would. My personal opinion is I'd rather build chemistry and not worry about the draft pick. You know, just we're going to get what we get. You know, we we don't seem to get luck when it comes to the NBA officiating, you know, draft picks, whatever. So that's my opinion. Alan, we're going to stick with you because I love one of the things that you said there. I mean, I've said multiple times on the podcast, this season has been before the trade. The This team was one of my least favorite, if not my least favorite team of all time, just because the expectations were so high. The talent was there, but the team just clearly didn't perform and they flat out look like half the time they didn't want to perform. And that includes De'Aaron Fox, who was before the trade deadline choosing to to sit out games. I don't necessarily blame him for how the uh, the the season was going. I don't necessarily blame him for being frustrated at the lack of support uh, that he's gotten in the in the last couple of off seasons. With Monty McNair's biggest moves being drafting two guards, but since then he traded away his first draft pick, a star 
potential guard in Tyrese Halliburton. And since that time, even with the Kings uh, losing games, De'Aaron Fox is on a tear over these last 10 games. Does that, Alan, fit into that entertaining loss kind of box? Is that specifically what you're looking for? Or is it more Fox playing well and the others supporting him a little better than they are? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that, uh, you know, to get to Tyrese, Tyrese is an interesting player and I think will be successful in the league, but I don't think those two work together. So I think that, you know, what people talk about, you know, that uh, Tyrese being traded unlocked De'Aaron Fox, but I think it's just a matter of fit and how it works together. And I think to me, that's, that's where I see a lot of potential. And to me, it's kind of like, you know, back to the, I remember, I watched Sabonis and Fox play and it reminds me of those, you know, early 2000s teams. And that's the kind of basketball that I want to watch as a fan. And so, you know, Hey, I I'd love to be able to watch fun basketball. That was my team. And, uh, you know, I'm too late in the game to change teams. That certainly is not happening, but uh, I would like to be able to, I mean, I will use example. I've been to two games this year because for multiple reasons, but they were, one was, they were both with Sabonis actually. One was against Indiana. We lost. It was a, one of those games we should have won. We could have won. And it was a disappointing loss. I went to the last, I guess the first game that they played against the Nuggets. Uh, and uh, it was a highly entertaining game. We lost, but I had a lot better time at that game than the first one. And I think that watching Jokic and Sabonis play against each other is going to be extremely fun for years to come. So I'm looking forward to what, what may happen and who knows what that looks like. So. Yeah, likewise, I think I uh, agree with you. I just think from a fan perspective, I'm not um, emotionally there, and that might sound really silly, but um, the Halliburton trade really, really um, affected me just from a, for, and this kind of comes from the perspective of Kings fans loving anybody who wears the uniform and it's kind of a rarity when they love you back um, as much as Tyrese did. So I think for me, just kind of knowing and understanding that the Kings are gonna try to be a good basketball team again, not necessarily a moral victory team again. Um, that took me a, a little bit to buy into, uh, especially given the fact that we have underperformed since the Sabonis trade, um, underperformed, comparatively. I mean, if you look at like stat muse, they love to remind Kings fans every day how um, good the Pacers are doing and how bad the Kings are doing and that ty the Tyrese trade is a generational mistake and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, like you said, Alan, it's like Fox needed somebody who was going to be his running mate. This is the, the most talented player right now that he's ever been paired with. And the opportunity is there. It's just um, a matter of figuring out the rest, I suppose. Um, Fox clearly wasn't putting his all into this into the in the beginning of the season, um, both when he was going through a slump, uh, like back in October, November, and then when he was turning on the Jets, he kind of shut them down on his own. So I feel like we're just now getting the Fox that we had like last winter. The arguably all-star Fox and it was a little bit too late for us to do anything significant this year but I would like to think that now that we have the pieces that um you know come next year we're able to have a realistic goal of being a 10th seed and that is such a low bar I <laughs> feel like you know we have to we have to be at least a, a 9 10 8 would be even like Kings fans dream of an, of an eighth seed at this point. I was a, I was a little bit emotional when uh, Ty got traded. Um, Tyrese was my favorite player. I do a lot of draft stuff. So I was huge on him the, the year that he was drafted and I was amazed that he fell to us. So he quickly became my favorite player here. And I just love that he kind of played with joy and you could always tell that he was giving effort. That's my one thing with Fox is I can never tell like, Half the time is giving effort. Half the time it just looks like he's ready to go home, which I'm not trying. I'm not here to drag De'Aaron, um, but at the same time, I kind of saw the trade as a not a win now move, but as a 
we are putting a timeline down for this team now because we have to show Sabonis something by the end of next year or right. we go into net the, the year after and he can be a free agent after. I know that he can sign a, an extension, but if we come into next season and we're the same team that we were that are, that we have been uh, post trade, um, do you really think he's going to want to stay long-term? That's the, the biggest thing that I've had to get over um, just with the tie trade. I think that um, Sabonis is a great player. He's uh, really surprised me. Um, this post defense is way better than I thought it would be. Um, I just, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm in on putting all of your eggs into the De'Aaron and Sabonis basket because they both have the same deficiencies that you can't have in today's NBA. Neither of them are, let's say, above average defenders. I, like I said, um, Sabonis is good in a post defense, but he's not a rim protector. I think his block rate is like historically low. Um, and he can't shoot threes. Fox has been on fire the last, or basically since the trade. He's been on fire, but it's taken all that fire just to get him up to like 30% for the season, just because of how bad he started. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the spacing is just going to be terrible until we can get some reliant, consistent shooters, which we traded both of the, even if Buddy was one for in one game, he was usually <laughs> six for 13 the next game or something like that. Um, so I, I liked Sabonis. I think the pairing can work but they've got to do a lot more this summer to, to make it um, to the point where I see it as being worth it. Because at this point right now, I mean, they're worse since the trade. They, the other teams in the West are going to get better going into next year. So unless they make significant moves this summer, I, I don't see them being much better than they are right now, which is 10th, 11th, maybe in the, in the, in the West. So I don't know. I, I hate to be the Debbie Downer of the group, but um, I it's been hard. But I think uh, I think it can work, um, and I'm excited to see how Monty kind of shapes this team around two guys who are kind of missing something that you desperately need in this uh, new age NBA. So it should be a, a fun uh, off season. This episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by Built Bar. It is March, ladies and gentlemen, but that does not mean that your New Year's resolutions have to be dead and gone. Even if you've stopped that resolution of eating healthier or uh, getting in shape, you can pick it back up and use Built Bar to help with that process. Built Bars are protein bars that taste like candy bars. Look, I'm a picky eater, period. And until Built Bars came around, I had no bars, protein bars, protein supplements that I liked because mostly I tasted the supplement itself. I didn't taste the flavor profile. Like a chocolate protein bar that I've had before Built Bar, I didn't taste as much chocolate as I tasted. You know, that just kind of that protein flavor. I can't even explain it. But that's not the case with Built Bars. Built Bars legitimately taste like candy bars. The flavor profile that you get is exactly what you taste. Like my favorite bar is the mint brownie bar. I feel like I'm eating mint chocolate chip ice cream, just it's not cold every time I'm I'm biting into a mint brownie uh, Built Bar. There are so many different flavors for you to try. If you go to Built.com, you can order a mixed box, try a bunch of flavors. They'll send a bunch to you. Their flavors are changing all the time to introducing more, more new flavors for you to check out. Or you have, can just build your own box. You can order the bar specifically that you want, the flavors that you love, and have, have them sent to you. Just use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Yeah, Devin, there are a lot of Kings fans that I know feel the exact same way that you do because, to be honest, a lot of Kings fans don't know any better. Like, you you need to see positive change before you can have optimism or even expectation that positive change is possible. And that's just because of how bad this Kings team has been. And we've talked about, like, the losing culture, how it's infected players. You know, uh, Marina, you talked about how D- uh, Tyrese, he seemed to love it here and want to play hard for... De'Aaron Fox was the exact same way when he first came to Sacramento. I remember after his first season, he did a Players' Tribune video saying how hard the Kings were going to play for Sacramento. And Fox has changed since that point. How much of that is because of the money that he was paid? 
I don't know if that has so much to do with it as much as the amount of losing that he suffered here that he hasn't at any point during his career. And even Tyrese Halliburton, the chatty, happy guy that we saw on draft day and that we got to talk to, he was already getting affected by wins. So it's a culture issue that needs to change. In regards to the timeline, um, you're right. The Kings are taking a risk in the sense that by trading for DeMontis Sabonis, you have two years to figure this out or you traded away Tyrese Halliburton for nothing. And in reality, that's not going to be Monty McNair's problem if that happens because McNair will be gone by that point in time, which would be a disaster for this organization. That's the problem for the next general manager who has the sorry uh, luck of, of having to take over and try and get this franchise to win. Uh, but in, in doing so, I actually think while the timeline might be scary for fans when you had control over a player like Halliburton, who I fully expect is going to shine in Indiana, he already is. Um, I, I think having a timeline like that with a sense of urgency with a front office who knows that they need to make changes, I think is essential for the success of the Kings at this point in time. The Kings can't just coast maybe like they did in the years with Vlade Divots and, and Devin, what you said, like the Kings uh, need to make moves this off season to get better. It's, it's not so much like a, a need to, they absolutely 100% have to, and there's no chance that McNair can get away with not making big moves and being super active this summer. The Kings need to be just as active this summer as they were, at least in rumors during the trade deadline. And so this Kings team has a lot of work to do. So by sitting on their hands, you're absolutely right. They condemn themselves. And this leads to the next question that I had. And I'll start with you, Marina. Expectations for this offseason and overall expectations for next season. You talked about the low bar of like a 10th or 9th seed, just making the play in, right? That was the expectation for this season when you didn't have DeMontis Sabonis. Now that you have a two-time All-Star in Sabonis with De'Aaron Fox, regardless of if we don't know what the supporting cast looks like, to me, minimum is eight seed next year. If you're making the play and you're hosting, or you're at least having a home game. But this Kings team, that's a big jump to ask from a team that's not going to make the playoffs again this year. But that's the expectation when you ha now have a big two and you've removed all excuses that De'Aaron Fox has at this point in time. Are your expectations around that same boat for the team next season? Or are you a little more willing to see them make the play in by any means necessary first before pushing that hard? Where are you guys at with that? I think by your logic, yes, they should be at least an eighth seed. But I think I've just seen too many years go by, you know, even going back to the boogie era of <laughs> the Kings where it was like we had this generational talent, you know, looking at the cast that was around him, we were on track for an eighth seed. And it's like, obviously that never panned out. And so I think I would love to believe that the minimum should be an eighth seed with Fox, Sabonis, and whoever uh, front office op personnel decide to bring in alongside them. However, I just don't feel like I'm, I, I have trust issues with the team and I don't trust them well enough to say for sure, like, yeah, I let's lock in that eighth seed. You know, I think uh, a nine, 10 would be, um, would be acceptable as, as framed right now. But again, like there's teams like Phoenix who went from having not made the playoffs in, you know, 10 years to making a NBA finals appearance. Now I'm not saying that we're acquiring Chris Paul or anything like that, but you look at like the Timberwolves who were out of it last year and now are making strides to be like a gen a genuine playoff contender, at least in the first round. Um, so I think as constructed, I, I, I'm not confident in saying an eighth seed, uh, the mystery roster that we'll find out over the summer where I hope, to see some bigger names or even just some realistic names um, that can so drastically change the, the outcome and the expectation. Um, even looking at like the Cleveland Cavaliers who no, no one had expectations of them this season, you know, they were written off very early and now they're gunning for a home, a home stand in the first round. So long story short, I would believe them to be an eighth seed uh on paper, but expect them to be somewhere in the nine ten. Yeah, um, I just think with uh, making the trade for Sabonis, you have to be in the actual playoffs, like seven eight, for him to even think about staying here long term. 
unless you really like Sacramento, which I don't blame them. Sacramento is nice, but um, you can get a lot of money elsewhere. Not as much as you can get if he resigns here, but I think um, you got to prove it to him that it's worth staying here this summer. And that starts with hiring a good coach. And then after you get that good coach, making a good draft pick and making some trades or signings this off season, which I mean, they're already kind of cash strapped because uh, they're going to work as an over the, the cap team. So they don't have that much to work with. And then Dante is probably going to take up a decent chunk of that if they decide to resign him. So, which is already a bad look if you trade for a guy who's about to go into free agency and then you don't resign him. So um, I think they've got their work cut out for them, um, but they have to show like major improvement. And I think um, like the Timberwolves, the Cavs, the two things or the one thing that both those teams had is they had top three picks. They had Anthony Edwards go number one and they had Evan Mobley go number three. Um, They needed those guys to kind of get them to where they are now. Um, Now it's not all on them, but um, competent coaching, good drafting and um, some moves in this off season that, uh, that don't set them back is going to be what it takes for sure. Um, do I have confidence? I have some confidence that Monty can uh, swing the moves, um, but uh, yeah, it's all kind of up into in his court now. I think uh, I think I'm interested to see what's going to happen. I know that obviously the team needs to build around Fox and Sabonis. I would love to see Harrison Barnes stay because when we talk about culture and building a culture. That certainly is a culture that someone who I would like to be part of that culture. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't have, you know, I don't, I'm not a, an analyst, so I can't give you, you know, so-and-so free agent draft picks. I would love to see Dante stay around. And I think fortunately for us, you know, he's coming off a huge injury and his play has been not up to standard, which will probably help us because his value is low. I don't think teams are going to come in, you know, uh, overbidding for him. You know, we can overbid for him. We have a great history of doing that. Um, but uh, but I think I think if we can keep him, there's a lot of promise there. And I don't you know, I just I think it's like I say, building a culture that that we haven't had in years. And I I use the analogy of when we traded Jason Williams away, people were just crazy because Jason Williams was so fun to watch. Uh, but I don't believe that we would have gone to the Western Conference Finals with Jason Williams as our point guard. Mm-hmm. So if you want to look at it that way, I think we're more likely to go somewhere with the fit of Sabonis than we would have with Halliburton. Now, not to say we wouldn't have been able to build something around Halliburton and Fox, but I think that our chances are better. And I keep my expectations low because that way I'm less disappointed. So, you know, yeah, I'd love to see them make the playoffs, but I would love to see entertaining basketball for a, you know, on a consistent basis. Instead of like one night, it'll be good. Or one half, it'll be good. Or, hey, which quarter are we going to play good in this game? And, hey, can we guess on when we're going to blow this lead? You know, I mean, so I... <laughs> I hope I hope for the future because I mean this city deserves it. The arena deserves it. You know this this arena will never be as loud as Arc Arena, but I think it can get loud. Even that last Nuggets game I went to, it was good to hear noise in the place. Mm-hmm. So I, I I hope that they can make good decisions. I like I like Monty McNair so far, but you know who knows. I do like the fact that we don't have a leaky front office. And we're not hearing, you know, all these rumors and this and, but at the same time, you know, even Pete Delisander would be a general best, a better general manager than me. So I'm not going to speak too much. So I don't know. Maybe not. We'll, we'll see. I, there might've been some decisions, Alan, that you could have made at that time that would have been better than what Pete Delisandro put together. You probably wouldn't have fired Mike Malone for no reason, yeah. <laughs> which would have uh, put this Kings in a significantly better position than they are in right now. And you're absolutely right too. You like, it's, as much as we're worried about five, six rungs up the ladder of what this team looks like when playoff season comes around, this team needs to develop an ability to be consistent on a nightly basis to where their own fans know what to expect other than expect chaos and, and, and pain. Like that's And that's what it's really been for this fan base for so long. And Alan, you touched on 
pieces of the supporting cast right now that you'd like to see stick around? I want to ask the same question, both uh, Devin and Marina, because I mean, you could look at this entire roster and say, I could see or make an argument for each one of these guys sticking around um, or, or hopefully coming back. There's some fringe talent pieces out there. Like a guy, for example, that I love is like Damian Jones. I think he's played very, very well. Don't know if he has a future here. If he's your backup center, I don't know if you're that much better of a team, but he plays hard consistently. I like him a lot, but I expect Harrison Barnes, Dante DiVincenzo, Rashawn Holmes to some extent, although I expect him to have a ton of value this offseason, the Kings to take advantage of that value. Uh, Davion Mitchell. These are guys that I expect to either be key pieces in offseason moves or be a part of this Kings core long term. Those names and maybe others that I missed, where are you guys at uh, with those names, wanting them to stick around, wanting to move on from them? Davion Mitchell, I think, is a big one because he's this season's rookie uh, who hopefully has a future, although clearly still has some building blocks to work on. Uh, where are you at with some of those names? I would, I think Davion Mitchell is a bit of a question mark um, because, you know, we were um, gifted this lovely summer league um, dream team. And I think that that was um, a good reflection of what Davion could be at that level. Um, you know, his defense was certainly as advertised coming off of his uh college run but I don't necessarily think his game has had the opportunity to translate um and only when we saw him you know in Fox's absence uh starting alongside Halliburton did we, re we really even get to see him start to flourish he's definitely had moments of of good quality basketball but I don't know what what um the Kings want to do with him I would like to see him you know run alongside them. I think he's an amazing presence. And I think that he brings that effort and that um, similarly to what you were saying, like about Damian Jones, not necessarily the number one option, but when he's out there, I love what he does. And I think that there's a lot of potential. However, um, on the flip, I would like to see that, um, you know, Mitchell being an older rookie, I would like to see that translation um, maybe sooner rather than later. And I don't know that Sacramento gives him that uh, that much time. So I wouldn't necessarily be surprised to see him go, although I, I would be a little disappointed. But um, definitely he would be somebody for me to, to watch um, going either way. And I completely agree. I would like to keep Harrison Barnes. Um, I expect them to, to keep him uh, around. I think Rashawn is interesting as well, just because of how his minutes have been eaten up uh, with the addition of Sabonis and his whole timeline since the trade deadline has been a bit, a little bit uh, vague. So um, not sure if we've seen him in, uh, you know, we're seeing his uh, farewell tour with Sacramento, but he would be deeply, deeply sought after by other people. If only, uh, if not in Sacramento beyond, I think Sacramento's raised his stock, which is kind of a funny thing to think. Um, but yeah, it could definitely go either way for, for Rashawn as well, I feel. Um, but those are kind of the two that, that stick out to me where I could see them staying or going. And I would like to see them. I would understand their, um, you know, being valuable assets, but I would also like to see them stay and build and work around Fox and Sabonis. I would love to see. I would love to see a scenario where we, where Rashawn Holmes would fit with this team. I just don't feel that he fits mm -hmm. with the Sabonis addition, and so I think he does have high value. And I think that you know, I don't know who I don't, I don't know who you're trading for, but I think he certainly has trade value. But I certainly would be, I would be disappointed to see him go. But I would be disappointed for his career for him to stay here in the mm. role he is currently in right. i think that would do him a disservice um so other than you know i mean i like and i like david mitch david mitchell um obviously he's a, he's a rookie i i don't have any other great suggestions beyond that <laughs> um i feel like I'm the cutthroat of the group. Um, <laughs> you are, but you right haven't been around as long as us, so you see it from a different lens, which I think people yeah. appreciate. Um, I just don't see the use in keeping around players that are 
contributing to a losing team and have been contributing to a losing team for the last three years. Mm. That doesn't mean I don't want to see him stay. I don't mind seeing Harrison Barnes stay, but I don't see this team getting significantly better with him as a third option still. And to get someone that's better than him, you're probably going to have to give him up mm. is my point of view. Um, and then just the, the rest of the roster wise, I, I think they need to find somewhere for Rashawn. Um, I, I don't see it working here. We already have five centers on the roster. We need to get a, get rid of at least two this off season. Um, that sounds mean. Uh, we need to give them opportunities elsewhere this off season. Um, and let's see, Dante. Um, I've seen things I've liked, not enough to make me want to spend the whole MLE on him. Um, if they can get him at a good rate, I, I'm for it. But uh, just overall, I haven't been super impressed with him so far. Um, Davion, I was pretty down on the pick when it happened. Uh, I went to the first summer league game um, in Sacramento and fell in love with him. And then the season started and like the, the shooting woes from his first two years of college before he went to Baylor kind of came back. Or Yeah, but basically, um, I don't see – the, the bones of this team right now being the ones that are going to be around if we become a winning team. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of to the point where I'm just keep Sabonis. You can keep Fox. Um, but I, I'm not going to attach myself to anyone outside of those two. Um, back when Bogey left, I kind of, came up with the, the phrase or the saying, you don't get out of the, the basement by overpaying role players. So even though I didn't want Bogey to leave, he was one of my favorites when he left. Um, I, I just don't see us being able to overpay a, a league average starter and make it a significant leap next year. So yeah, that's my, uh, my cloudy pessimistic view of things. Locked on Kings brought to you by Bet Online. It's that time of the year again. College basketball's tournament is finally upon us. It's March, and we know that time of year is always exciting, especially if you are a Kings fan with your eye on the draft. And from all the latest odds, contests, and player props, Bet Online. .net is the number one source for all of your sports betting needs and info. Bet online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, your podcasts, and your news this season. And it's not just basketball, of course. Bet online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information and your needs, including live betting and even your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action at Bet Online, where the game starts. Actually, I want to ask you uh, specifically you one question about the draft because you mentioned your interest in the draft. And then I have one more question uh, for both Marina and Alan in regards to um, to Arco Arena, who his name has been back in the headlines here recently. Uh, so I'll get to that one in just a sec. But specifically for you, Devin, you, you said looking for that that third option guy and you don't think it's possible for the Kings to find that third option guy while Harrison Barnes is still here. I agree with you that if Harrison Barnes is your third option, he either has to get far more consistently score. Like he has to become more of a consistent scorer, which we've seen moments where he has been and then moments where he'll only take eight shots, which just to me is is unforgivable, especially when you don't have DeMontis Sabonis playing. Um, but is it possible that the Kings hold on to Harrison Barnes, use their draft pick to go and find that third guy, whether it's there's hypothetical scenario after hypothetical scenario, the Kings using their pick and Rashawn Holmes to go and get an, a, a current NBA player. But in terms of draft talent, let's say in that like top five, top six range, is there a player that fits both a need and can be that, that third option guy in your mind uh, that can take that role for the Kings and, and be able to run with it immediately that can help that kind of leap? Or is that too much to put on a rookie? Uh, I think it might be a little too much to put on a rookie. Um, I've been watching a lot of Keegan Murray recently, and uh, obviously he's killing it in um, the uh, the tournament right now. I mean, not the March Madness, but the, his conference tournament. Um, I don't think it's fair to put the expectations of being a third option on him in his rookie year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if the Kings 
do what they typically do. And once they're eliminated from playoff contention, go ahead and win three out of their last six games. And that pick turns from a five or six to an eight or nine. And you're just going to draft another average starter at best. Usually um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be real tough, but uh, I think, I, I would love to see Keegan Murray on the on the team. Um, I I'm still getting into my draft stuff this year, so I usually kind of ramp up around now. Um, hopefully, some guys kind of um, show out in March Madness. I know uh, Benedict Matherin is a good wing level player that has shown some defensive promise. So you know, but I don't. He's another one of those guys where I don't see him being the thing that pushes us to the next level. So, um, yeah, I think it's a little, a little too much to ask of a, of a draft pick to be the third option on this team going forward. But, um, if we can do it, I'm, I'm all for it. Finally guys, uh, Arco arena, I will continue to call my second home. It was my second home growing up. And and I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to build a, a career professionally covering the team that I grew up a diehard fan of. And I fell in love with basketball, not necessarily Kings basketball, but basketball because of Arco thunder, because of that building, I can still smell that concourse. When I think about it, I can still see it, feel those seats as uncomfortable as people thought they were. I loved them as a kid. Uh, the, the, the red and, and blue of the Royals or for or the legit old Kings that, that took over a, a purple building for some reason. Um, but that building is being torn down. I'm, very excited to see that it's going to become, a, I think, like a hospital space in Sacramento, which I think is phenomenal. Um, but every single time I, I drive past that building, whether I'm on I-5 I or I just see it in the distance, I always have a little bit of a smile uh, just remembering memories in those buildings. So does anybody have memories, stories from Arco that they want to share? Uh, just your overall thoughts on that building, because as nice as the Golden One Center is, and trust me, it's a legitimate arena, The how downtown has benefited. I love everything about the Golden One Center. Can't wait to see actual playoff basketball in there because I do think it's going to get loud. But Arco will forever be like my mecca of basketball uh, in, in so many ways. So I'm curious if you guys feel the same way. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly sad um, to see it go. But like you said, happy that it's going to be going towards something that the city can benefit from and the community can benefit from. But um, I feel like in a way I, I grew up with Arco Arena. I mean, that's where I saw my first Kings game and my first Monarchs game, my first concert. Um, I had, you know, the Harlem Globetrotters and Disney on Ice. And there was just so much... Uh, that happened in that arena outside of basketball where I experienced youth and adolescence and found my love for for what is now um, the Kings. And like you said, as much as I love Golden One Center and how beautiful it is, and I'm so glad that we've made strides to make uh, Doco what it is and um, give fans that experience. Um, it's a little sad because as much as we didn't like being called a cow town, I think we embraced it and Arco Arena was the the um, the foundation of that and it represents a lot of that history that we have there. And so uh, looking forward to going on Saturday and celebrating it with Kings fans also. Yeah, I don't want to make this a three-hour podcast, so I won't go into all of my memories. But, I mean, that's where I grew to love basketball and watching live basketball and, you know, the sound and the noise in that arena, I don't think will ever be replicated. And, I mean, I have, like I said, I have way too many memories. I mean, I was just thinking today, the 2000 playoffs, my son in his mom's stomach, she was like, probably seven months pregnant. He wow. was throwing elbows like he was Carl Malone. You could literally see him, you know, like <laughs> because it was so loud. He was just, you know, like, hey, you know, let me out. Um, but, uh, but I mean, it was just amazing. But at the same time, you know, yeah, for years you could look around, oh God, this place. And, you know, I had the opportunity to do a tour of some of the, you know, the locker rooms and the visiting dressing rooms. And you're like, uh, Elton John has to sit in this green room that has like your cast off furniture in it. Um, but I am looking forward to going on Saturday and getting that closure and, uh, you know, taking some tools and seeing what I can get by with without getting accosted by security. No. Um, anyway, I mean, you know, like I said, I have, I have so many memories there that I just, 
But I mean, like I said, literally game seven of the 2002 uh, Western Conference Finals. Get fourth quarter. I've got to go to the bathroom. Real quick. Oh, I got to run to the bathroom. Run out to the concourse. I'm coming back from the bathroom. I see there's somebody bringing boxes, like, you know, brown cardboard boxes to the little mobile merch stand there. And I'm like, that's the Western Conference Championship merchandise. And then, of course, mm. those boxes probably were not opened. Yeah. Um, so those are things that stick in my head. But, I mean, so many memories and such a special place that, you know, it. There will never be anywhere like it, but you know, that's uh, my old old head, as the kids would say. So, <laughs> Devin, did you ever get a chance to to go to a game at, at Arco? I did not. I uh, yeah. I moved up here um, right at the beginning of 2020, so um, I have only known Golden One. Um, I didn't have the privilege to be able to go to any games at Arco. Um, I wish I could have, um, but yeah, I don't really have the emotional connection that anyone else here has to it. So I will let you guys talk. I don't, I'm definitely not going to make this three hours. So go for it. <laughs> well, one, one thing is uh, you ask any Kings fan who went to games in Arco, they have something to tell you about that building, just memories of that building. And, and I'm excited about that. Cause I'm going to be doing a later on this week before Saturday's farewell to Arco event. I'm going to be doing a podcast, just sharing some of my stories and my memories growing up in that building. I want listeners, uh, Alan Marina, you guys sending in, uh, different uh, stories that you have of uh, Arco because I think it's just so fascinating to hear how many uh, wonderful things happened in that building for so many Kings fans. And then listeners, listen to the podcast. Please feel free to send in some of your memories too because it's going to be an emotional day for me very much. And I think we're if nothing else, we can disagree about everything. And even Devin, you never saw it, but you'll agree with us anyway. We're all in agreement that that, that sixth man golden statue needs to be pulled out of the weeds over there and put somewhere in Doko. As much as I love the piglet, don't get me wrong, as much as I love the piglet, move that thing over or find a place to put that six because, and while we're at it, why don't, why, if anybody remembers the gigantic inflatable uh, Pepsi soda oh, can yeah. that we used to have outside of games as well. We got to bring that back as well. Just do everything from the early 2000s that we could possibly do to, to, to uh, spruce up Doco and, and maybe that'll help bring some of the magic back. But Guys, I, I appreciate this so much. This was so much fun. Definitely the first uh, of, of many uh, Kings Roundtable, Kings Fan Roundtables that we're going to do. Uh, and we're going to do future ones where I absolutely will invite uh, you guys back on. So thank you so much for uh, your opinions. Thank you so much for listening, being not just fans and listeners of Locked On Kings, but fans of this team when in very many ways they don't deserve it. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys on. Thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to doing it again with you all and, and, and chatting with you all and seeing you at the Golden One Center uh, very, very soon. Well, thanks for having me. We'll see you Saturday. <laughs> Huge thank you to Alan, Marina, and Devin for joining me here. Three very different perspectives that I absolutely love that went, I mean, that's exactly what I wanted from this. And I enjoyed the hell out of it. I hope you did as well. And I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Again, if you want to be a part of them, if you haven't already reached out to me and I've told you uh, that your name is on the list, keep bugging me because uh, I want to make sure I'm doing more of these and get so many different Kings fans on uh, the, the amazing listeners that we have of this podcast, just amazing fans of this team, period. Uh, are, are something that I like to celebrate. And I, I want my people. You're, you, you, I am you. We are Kings fans together. Uh, so I want to make sure I'm sharing this platform and we can have more conversations like we had today. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Tomorrow might not be as fun. The Kings hosting the Chicago Bulls game one of a really tough four game homestand. Regardless of the result of that game, we will have a post game pod for you. Uh, plus, later on this week, as I tease there at the end, uh, I am going to be doing just a dedicated Arco Arena memories uh, podcast here on Locked on Kings, sharing some of my stories, sharing some of your stories about that wonderful building. Uh, so I'm looking forward to doing that. I hope you'll join me for those future episodes of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to Locked on. Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.